Let's take our Bibles again, look in Jeremiah chapter 15, as we continue our reading through this prophet of the Old Testament, raised up really to preach a message of condemnation. The Lord had his remnant, for sure, maybe Jeremiah being one of the chosen that God had spared in the midst of all the wickedness going on. And some may ask, as you read on and see this chapter, chapter of condemnation, well, imagine this being a trial. And uh, these are charges, these are indictments that God is bringing against this people Israel. And uh, with reason, he's a just God. And it's just like in modern day trials, you have the prosecution that stands up first and presents its case. And then you have the defense then that stands up to present its case in defense. Well, here's the prosecution. This is God himself. But guess what? By the time he's done, there's no defense. In fact, we're going to see this here with regard to what the Lord says to Jeremiah in verse 1. And we'll read from verse 1 down to verse 14 for this reading. And it begins, Then said the Lord unto me, this is God's word, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, here he's telling Jeremiah, don't even think about bringing a defense. Though Moses and Samuel stood before me to present some sort of defense against my dealings with this people, yet my mind could not be toward this people. So much for those that preach that somehow God loves everybody and has a wonderful plan for their life. He says, cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. That's his judgment. So there will be no argument to persuade God in any other way. Now when he cites Moses and Samuel, and in essence is saying to Jeremiah not to pray for the people, because God had already determined their fate of judgment and exile. Moses and Samuel back and read in their history there were times where they prayed they interceded and God did hear their prayer Moses seemed to as God purposed to destroy Israel and Moses pled with them back there in Exodus 32 that God determined not to destroy the people and Samuel same thing when he prayed the people were rescued what from what seemed to be certain destruction. But here, the Lord lets them know that the judgment has been determined. I have people that ask me from time to time, well, how is it that you know whether or not to continue to pray for certain people? Well, it's the Lord that gives the prayer, but it's the Lord who takes it away. And you and I know of different acquaintances perhaps that the Lord just has not given that prayer. True prayer is being directed by the Spirit of God. So here in verses 2 through 4 then of this particular scripture, it shall come to pass, if they say unto me, Whither shall we go forth? Thou shalt tell them, Thus saith the Lord, such as are to death, such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as are for the famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. And I will appoint over them four kinds, saith the Lord, the sword to slay, the dogs to tear, the fowls of the heaven, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. And I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. So here we see the Lord appointing four different types of destruction. 
I hear people say all the time, well, God chooses for salvation, but he doesn't ordain to condemnation. You haven't read the scriptures then. Where should we go? That's the question that's asked there in verse 2. God had promised in the previous verse that Judah would be cast out of his sight and would be sent forth. And so here, it's as if the question is anticipated. Where should we go? And the Lord declares, death, sword, famine, captivity. Some would go to death through a plague. That's what that seems to imply there. Pestilence. Is the Lord in plagues? Is he in viruses? Absolutely. Some will die in battle. That's what he means by the sword. Some would perish through famine. Now remember, because this Babylonian captivity just didn't happen at one time. It happened on three different occasions where Nebuchadnezzar came down and took people out. And he says the remaining, if any would remain alive, they'll go into captivity. There is no good way to die. That's what the Lord was declaring here. And then you see also concerning the dead, he mentions four forms of destruction. There would be ways in which those corpses would be dishonored after death. As if the death in of itself is not enough of a judgment. Here the Lord is saying that it would come through the sword, but then he says there through dogs. In verse 3. So that means the sword slain, but then what? The bodies wouldn't even be buried. The dogs would come and devour those corpses and the fowls of the heaven. This is talking about carnivorous birds that would come and feed upon the bodies. And then if there remained anything else, the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. To the Jewish people, there's nothing more dishonorable than not having a proper burial for dead people. Even today, it's their custom if someone dies to make sure they have a proper burial by sundown. That's how quickly they do it. They don't waste a lot of time. They want it to be a proper burial. But here, the Lord is saying that when slain, these corpses would undergo even further humiliation. It's as if the Lord is saying, don't weep for them, because he's purposed this desecration. And why? It goes back to what we studied when we were in 2 Kings chapter 21. It speaks there of Manasseh. He was the son of Hezekiah. Remember, Hezekiah was one of the Lord's servants, kings that he raised up to bring about reform and put away idolatry in the land. In fact, one of the things that the children of Israel at that time were worshiping was the brazen serpent of all things, and Hezekiah destroyed it. And then his son came into power and you wonder, well, why does the Lord mention specifically Manasseh here when all these other evil kings reigned even before Hezekiah? Well, the presumption is that the son would have seen his father's heart toward God and desire to rid the nation of Israel of its idolatry. And the Lord used him strongly in that way. But... When he, Manasseh, became king, he reversed everything and went right back to what his father had destroyed. Is there a time where God will no longer show his forbearance toward a people, and toward a nation? Absolutely. That's what we find here. The Lord himself drawing the line. Referring to what took place with Manasseh for that which he did in Jerusalem. Now remember when we studied that, interestingly, as monstrous as Manasseh was, yet in the end, in 2 Chronicles 33, we read that Manasseh found grace in the eyes of the Lord. 
the Lord forgave him and yet did not undo what his legacy was and required then those crimes that's described as crimes against the innocent and then the sins that he taught his people to embrace for that the Lord would bring them into judgment and he, he describes what it is there verse 4 I will cause them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth it's interesting I did a little study because from this time forward the Babylonian captivity even though the Lord has after the captivity brought people back into Israel and uh, throughout all the different nations that were raised up yet from this time forward Israel has remained a dispersed people even in Christ's day they were dispersed Peter describes them as those that were pilgrims and strangers dispersed into all these countries. I looked it up. The last census is of 2020 has about 9 million people, 9,227 that actually live in Israel. That's the total population of the nation, the country of Israel. And of those, only 6,829,000 are Jews. So that means that only 74% of the population of Israel itself can claim any kind of Jewish roots. So even from this particular captivity in Assyria, God has, has mingled this people, dispersed them. In the total population of the world, they judge to be about 14 million total Jews. That's only 0.2%. Of a population of like 7.89 billion total. And yet the Lord has always preserved that nation. But when he says here, I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth, that wasn't just for a time. He purposed that they should be scattered. And here specifically, he pronounces this judgment on them as a whole, as a nation, but then there's always a remnant, mercy on a remnant. When he says, for who shall have pity upon thee, O Jerusalem, or who shall bemoan thee, or who shall go aside to ask how thou doest? I'll tell you what, if God ever gives up a, a nation or a people, there's nobody that's going to stand before God to even ask on their behalf. He says in verse 6, Thou hast forsaken me, saith the Lord. Thou art gone backward. Therefore will I stretch out my hand against thee and destroy thee. I am weary with repenting. Now, this is human language. We know that God is not a God that repents. Here the word perhaps might be better translated relenting or forbearing. But here God was withholding his hand and these thinking that because the destruction had not immediately taken place that now they were okay. But the Lord used this human language, I am weary with relenting. There's a time when God's forbearance is no more. He doesn't change his mind with regard to his judgment. Those that he's determined to judge will be judged, but that time is by God's determination. And he says in verse 7, And I will fan them with a fan in the gates of the land. That's not our modern day fan. The word there literally is the winnowing. When I was growing up in Africa and worked over there. We saw when the women would bring the rice back from the field and pound it, they had these little winnowers that were made out of woven and, and they would literally take and face the wind and throw that rice up in the air and the chaff would blow away. This is the picture here of God that would scatter Judah as if it were a winnowing fan. But he also says here in verse 8, their widows are increased to me above the sand of the seas. 
God determines who lives and dies. In this particular instance, he's speaking of removing the heads of the families, the fathers, and uh, the husbands, so that the widows are preserved, even though the husbands and fathers are carried away. He said, I have brought upon them against the mother of the young men a spoiler at noonday, which I have caused them to fall upon it suddenly, and tears upon the city. Here we find the, the widow, in verse 9, she that hath borne seven languisheth. Normally, having seven children was considered to be a blessing. In fact, it's in fact, it's not a great blessing that God would so bless a woman. And yet, it says here, she hath given up the ghost. Her son has gone down while it was yet day. She had been ashamed and confounded, and the residue of them will I deliver to the sword before their enemies, saith the Lord. To have seven children, seven sons, would be a picture of complete happiness, but not in this case. So when Jeremiah reads all this in verse 10, or sees it, he says, woe is me. He takes all this on himself. My mother that thou hast borne me a man of strife, a man of contention to the whole earth. Here's where you find Jeremiah as a type of Christ, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. I have neither lent on usury, nor men have lent to me on usury, yet every one of them doth curse me. That's a picture of Christ and his perfection as he walked on this earth. Men found reason to curse him, and yet he had done nothing for which they had any reason to curse him. It speaks of Christ and Scripture as being hated without cause. And Jeremiah is a type here, and this is his complaint. The Lord said, Verily it shall be well with thy remnant. There's the, in the midst of judgment, his mercy. That even though God had purposed to destroy the majority, and condemn them, yet he speaks here of a remnant. Verily it shall be well with thy remnant. Not only that people that God would preserve through Jeremiah's preaching and prophesying, but even himself being preserved, because he says, Verily I will cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil and in the time of affliction. This was God's answer to Jeremiah's plight. And this was literally fulfilled when they sought to kill Jeremiah and threw him in a dungeon, as we're going to read on later on in this, this book. But at one point, Nebuchadnezzar, that's when it says there, I will cause the, the enemy to entreat. Here's the, here's the enemy that God has brought against Israel, and yet he would cause Nebuchadnezzar to be kind to Jeremiah when he gave Nebuchadnezzar, his commander-in-chief, the order, and that's over in Jeremiah 39, 11, to look after Jeremiah and to do him no harm, grant him all the privileges he was pleased to ask. I see a type and picture of Christ, too, where even though all of these were against him, yet they could not do one thing more or less than what God had purposed. Even when Pilate said, don't you know I have the power to crucify you? He said, you'd have no power at all for what it was given up with my father. And so the question is asked here in verse 12, shall iron break the northern iron and the steel? So when something about the northern iron, that was the place up in Babylon, because Babylon was north of Israel and the weapons of Babylon being iron and bronze up in that particular part of the country of Babylon the what they call the northern ore back in the 7th, 7th century before Christ from the Black Sea region actually is where people would go to get some of the finest iron ore and bronze and he says shall iron break the northern iron and the steel. Can man, could there be any weapon that could be 
made to stand against what God had purposed should come about from Babylon. He said, thy substance and thy treasures will I give to the spoil without price, and that for all thy sins, even all thy borders. The purpose to take everything that was considered to be treasures, even in the house of the Lord. See, they blasphemed the house of the Lord. They perverted it, so the Lord took all those treasures and removed them. Babylon didn't have to pay anything for them. Took them into Babylon, where they were preserved and later brought back. But he said, I will make thee to pass with thine enemies into a land which thou knowest not. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, which shall burn upon you. This is a God that the world doesn't know. All of all of you hear about today, oh, how God is love. God is love, but he loves his son. He loves his righteousness. And he loves those that he's purposed to save in the son. Other than that, the scriptures say the wrath of God abides upon the sinner. And we'll pause there. And next time, take a look at Jeremiah's prayer. From verse 15 down to verse 21. Let's look to the Lord ourselves. Precious Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would truly cause our hearts to pause before you and consider that if you've been merciful to such sinners as we are, it's only because of your grace toward us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that you have not destined such as we are to wrath and condemnation, although that is our just desert but that the Lord Jesus Christ himself bore it. And by his death, such as we are, that you purposed are justified, declared righteous before you. The holy God, you are, and the one to be glorified. I pray that you would keep our eyes fixed upon your son, and his cross in all things, and give you the praise, honor, and glory, our dear Savior's name. Amen.